Hi, I'm Rich Harwood, and welcome to another episode of Harwood Half Hour. It's good to be with you. It's it's good to have a chance to talk again about what's going on in our country, in our communities, and in our lives. You know, on Tuesday, uh, March 1st, President Biden will deliver his first State of the Union message to a joint session of Congress and to the American people, we the American people. And Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds will provide the Republican response. The State of the Union comes, well, as the pandemic is easing, Ukraine has been invaded, the Build Back Better legislation is stalled, and we anticipate any day now the nomination of the first African-American woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. The State of the Union also comes at a time when our nation seems to be splitting apart at the seams. At a recent annual national prayer breakfast that is held every year, the president said, the issue for us is unity. The issue for us is unity. And then he asked this question, how do we unite again? How do we unite again? So today on Harwood Half Hour, I wanna talk about how the president can use his State of the Union message coming up on March 1st to help bring more of us together, to help bring more Americans together. Now, here's some quick context. Last Tuesday, uh, the Harwood Institute released uh, its latest report in partnership with the Kettering Foundation entitled Civic Virus, Why Polarization is a Misdiagnosis. In essence, the report says this, that the conventional wisdom that Americans are polarized is simply wrong. It's simply wrong. We found something else. We found something that is much more troubling, much more profound, and frankly, much more perilous to the nation's health. We found that we're suffering from a long-term civic virus, not simply the pandemic that we have just gone through in two plus years, but a civic virus that has been incubating for the last three or four decades or more. And what we found is that we Americans, well, we're segregating and separating from one another due to the unrelenting fear and anxiety in terms of what's happening around us and what's happening to our own lives. And at the time that we feel this deep anxiety about what's happening, which started again before the pandemic, our political leaders, the news media and social media are deliberately, intentionally stoking polarization for their own political gain, for their own power grabs, for their own benefit. We see it each and every day. And it is creating for, well, all of us, for so many of us, a kind of surround sound in which we are being subjected to this kind of alternate reality that is confusing, disorienting, destabilizing us in our lives. I don't know if you feel this, I know that I feel it every time I turn on the news at night and and pretty quickly turn it back off some nights. This surround sound that's destabilizing us, that's confusing us, that's disorienting us, it's kind of like being in a house of mirrors where you know there's a doorway out, but you, well, you just can't seem to find it. And well, you probably know from your own personal life, there is no worse feeling in the world than feeling trapped, that there's no way to escape the kind of anxiety, the disorientation, the confusion, this kind of surround sound that's engulfing us each and every day. And seeing no way out, what we found is not polarization. We found something much different. We found an ex- instinctive human response to anxiety and fear and confusion, which is fight or flight that so many of us, we Americans, are engaged in a kind of instinctive response of fight or flight. And we are breaking up into smaller and smaller groups and tribes and clans and camps, well, to protect ourselves, to find people who we agree with, who affirm us, who accept us. And that's even leading some of us to extreme measures to join groups like QAnon and other groups that are at the extremes of American society right now. So if this undercurrent, if this is the undercurrent in the State of the Union today, and it's been incubating for decades, then how can the president, 
addressed the American people, we the American people, in his State of the Union message on Tuesday, March 1st. So in typical Harwood Institute fashion, I was sitting at my desk here in my home study that you can see behind me. And I thought, well, why don't we create a tool? Why don't we create a tool that folks can use, that you can use, that all of us can use, that I'm going to use when I watch on Tuesday to help follow and make sense of the present state of the union speech that you can use to listen to the speech. And when I mean, when I say make sense of it, I mean, what is he really talking about? Does it address the things that we really care about? Is he speaking in language and in terms that make sense to us? Is what he's saying meeting me and the folks I know, whether in my family or friends or colleagues, is he meeting me, is he meeting us where we are as opposed to where maybe he wants us to be? And so we created this little tool, this little State of the Union tool. Um, that we're gonna send to you in the chat box right now, if you're watching live, if you listen to this uh, as a tape, as a recording, um, you can download this tool from our homepage on our website, the www.theharwoodinstitute.org. It'll be down in the feature section, just click it on, print it out, and you can use it. And you can use it. And so what I did in creating this tool is I looked in the civic virus report, there are 10 findings. And I pulled out four that I think cut to the core of what so many of us are wrestling with. And that I also believe the president really needs to address um, when he's speaking on Tuesday at his State of the Union message. And one other quick thing, when you use this tool, when you watch the State of the Union message, which I hope you do, and perhaps the Republican response from Governor Reynolds from, from Iowa, You'll see at the bottom of the tool an email address. And I'd love for you to email me back your thoughts. How did the president score? How did Governor Reynolds score? What did you make of what they said? So email me back at rich at the harwoodinstitute.org. And I promise I'll reply to every person that sends me an email. I will personally reply to your email because I want to hear what you're thinking about. What this speech says to you, does it make sense to you? Does it meet you where you are? Does it speak to the things that concern you in your lives each and every day? And so here we go. Four findings from our civic virus report, why polarization is a misdiagnosis, and some ways in which you can think about, which are in the tool, ways in which you can think about what the president and then what the Republican governor from Iowa in her response to the president's State of the Union message, what they're saying. So here we go. The first finding is this. In the report, we say people are experiencing a profound sense of loss of reality and control, leaving them dizzied, disoriented, and feeling helpless, and feeling helpless. And so here's what I think we ought to be thinking about when we're watching the president's speech. Does the president speak plainly and when I say plainly, I mean plainly, directly, clearly, succinctly about what people are experiencing today in their lives. Does he help us cut through the noise of this surround sound that we're engulfed by? Or does he add to the noise? Does he add to the noise? And does he acknowledge, because so much of what we're feeling, this sense when you're feeling dizzy, disoriented, and feeling helpless, Policy achievements and proposals can be helpful, but they're not enough. They're not enough because we know that simply putting policy proposals forward or talking about one's achievements won't necessarily stop the noise that we're hearing. It won't cut through the noise that we're engulfed by. It won't help us make sense of the world around us, which so many of us are yearning for and need today to be regrounded and in a sense reawakened to what's happening around us, but in a way that we can hear it, and in a way that we can digest it, and in a way that meets us where we are. You know, there's an old country song, the refrain of which is, I can't see me in your eyes anymore. I, I love that refrain, I use it a lot. And I think more than anything, what people wanna know is that they are seen and heard. 
that they can hear themselves in what other people are saying, that they can make sense of the world around them. I can't see me in your eyes anymore. Think about it. And so I want to be clear about this. I am not suggesting, nor arguing for, nor do I believe that this is a moment where the president needs to feel our pain. You know, I feel your pain. I, I don't think that's what this is about. I think this is more fundamental. It's about starting where people are. When an individual, when perhaps you, when I am in a instinctive response of fight or flight, what's critical to sort of diffuse it, to lower the temperature, to make you feel safe, which is why you're in fight or flight, because you feel unsafe. What becomes important is that you feel heard, that you feel seen, that you feel understood. Does the president do that? Does he speak plainly to where we are and who we are and what we're wrestling with? Or does he simply jump to policy proposals and achievements and leave all of this behind? So that's number one. We're experiencing this profound sense of loss of reality and control, which leaves us feeling dizzy, disoriented, and feeling helpless. Here's number two. Number two, as you heard me say earlier, many political leaders the news media and social media are manufacturing polarization to stoke division and pursue their own self-interest. And this is creating this kind of overwhelming surround sound that's engulfing us, that's pushing us further apart, further segregating and separating us, and creating a deeper sense of anxiety because when you already feel anxious and someone starts yelling at you and telling you things that are untruths or just false or are lies, but you can't quite figure out what's going on, what does it do? It creates more anxiety, more confusion, more disorientation. It's one of the worst things that can happen. And so here, my question on the scorecard for the president and the Republican response from Governor Reynolds is, does the president in his State of the Union speech directly, plainly, clearly, succinctly commit, make a clear commitment to lower the temperature of rhetoric in Washington, D.C.? Does he make that commitment? And that's not enough. Does he make a commitment in this time of division and political leaders stoking and manufacturing polarization for their own gain? Notwithstanding that, or in spite of it, does he make a commitment to find common ground with where possible, with whomever he can find common ground within his own Democratic caucus or across the aisle with Republicans? But there's more. There's more than this. Because as you know, and I know, that no matter how hard the president tries, and I believe he needs to try because he is the president of the United States, and we only have one president at a time that he needs to set the tone, he needs to set the pace. That's part of being a leader in our country. He needs others to come with him. He can't do it alone. He can't go it on his own. And so here's the thing, in his speech, in the well of the House of Representatives, in front of a joint session of Congress, does he directly challenge Congress to join him in making a commitment to lower the temperature. You know how they all stand up. Sometimes just the Democratic side stands up for the president. Sometimes the Republican side just stands up when they wanna, if it's a Democratic president, uh, oppose something. When he challenges the joint session of Congress, do both sides stand up? Do both sides make a public declaration that we're going to take action to lower the temperature in Washington, D.C., to stop the confusion, to stop the noise, to stop the manufactured polarization. There has to be a sense of public accountability at work. And we need to hold our elected officials accountable for what they say and do. So that's the second one, right? If the first one is we're experiencing this profound sense of loss of reality and control and it's making us dizzy and disoriented and feeling helpless, and the second one is that our political leaders, the news media and social media are intentionally manufacturing polarization. If you can even believe that, that makes any sense at all. 
which is creating this surround sound, which is creating even more anxiety for us. The third finding that I wanted to highlight from our civic virus report is this. People saw vivid examples of community action throughout the pandemic. You saw it, I saw it. I know I've held Harwood Half Hours special editions on this during the pandemic, where people reached out to shut in seniors to make sure that they had food and their prescriptions, where people created hotspots in communities so kids who didn't have access to the internet could do their homework and gain access to the internet, that there were new support groups that formed right? There are all sorts of things that people did that we actually talk about and illuminate and lift up in our civic virus report. It's incredibly, incredibly inspiring. But here's the thing. As much as people saw these vivid examples of community action throughout the pandemic, they are uncertain about whether these responses will last. Still, Most people believe that change must start in our local communities. And so here's the thing I wonder about whether or not the president will do this in his State of the Union message and the governor of Iowa will also in her response. Does the president make a direct ask, a direct ask of the American people to step forward, to turn outward toward one another and to build together on the positive community actions that emerged during the pandemic? Does he look into the camera, right? On the last one, I was asking him to look straight into the eyes of of those members of Congress who are sitting before him in in the House of Representatives. Now, I'm asking him to look directly at each of us through the camera and ask us, will you step forward? Will you turn outward toward your neighbors? Will you join together to build on the positive examples of change that we saw in our communities during the pandemic? And here's why it's so important, because it seems to me that it's only by taking action together that we can begin to see and hear one another. It's by taking action together that we can come to recognize that we each hold innate capabilities to take action. It's only by us taking action together that we actually can create something together. It's by taking action together and working together that you and I and others will come to realize that we actually have a sense of humor and that we will recognize and even maybe celebrate our shared humanity, notwithstanding our real differences. And there are real differences in the country. And when we come together to step forward and to turn outward and to build together, I just wanna mention one thing that I've mentioned many times before. It doesn't matter how big or small the action is that you take, no one cares. It simply doesn't matter and don't let anyone tell you that your action is too small. Your action is never too small. Your action is never inconsequential. What we want, what we Americans, I include myself in this, what we want more than anything is to come to believe in ourselves and in one another that we can actually come together and get stuff done. It's that simple. We wanna rebuild our trust in one another. We wanna rebuild our connection to one another. We want to rebuild our shared humanity together. And we, yes, we need to rebuild our civic confidence together. And so don't let anyone tell you that your action is too small. You know, I've said this before, I'm I'm a Jew and in Judaism, there's a, a teaching, if you save one life, you save the world. And obviously if you save one life, you don't save the world. But the, the meaning of it is that if you save one life, you're making a down payment on saving the world. That if you save one life, you're making a real contribution to the world. And so whatever your religious teachings may be, or if you're a non-believer, whatever spiritual teachings you look to, or if you're not spiritual, whatever you look to in your life, I'm sure somewhere there is a sense that your contribution matters, it's valued, we need it. And don't let anyone tell you that whatever contribution you make, it is too small because it's not. But I wanna be clear about something in saying this. I wanna be really clear about this. Talk alone cannot get us out of the bind that we're in. We can't talk our way out of this. We can't hold enough community forums to get everyone together and 
talk. There isn't enough hand holding and singing kumbaya and even having hard conversations, which we need desperately. Hard, honest, open conversations. We need them desperately. But let me be clear. They're not going to do it. They're, they are necessary, but insufficient. They cannot create the momentum we need by building together, by, as I said before, seeing and hearing each other in new ways, by seeing that we have innate capabilities to take action together, that seeing that we can rebuild our sense of connection and trust and civic confidence together. That comes from building, from holding a ladder for someone else, by giving them a paintbrush, by by spotting them, by, by helping out and getting something done, by visiting people who are shut-ins who need our help. It happens by getting up and getting in motion and getting moving and achieving things together, not just talking. So if those are the first three, the fourth is this. The fourth is this. People said that while being an American is an important part of who they are, being part of America, is compli complicated and strained for many. Being part of America is complicated and strained for many. And so here my question for the president in his State of the Union message and for the Republican governor from Iowa is this. Does the president talk openly, openly, about how people with different lived experiences see America today? Because in this civic virus report, we have a whole finding on this. And my God, people do see this country differently today. Their lived experiences are very different. Our lived experiences are different. Some folks we talk to hold this firm and fervent belief in America, no matter what. There are others who came to this nation as immigrants and see this as a land of opportunity, and they are enormously grateful. There are others who see our failings in our history and in our current lives, whether it's around social justice or the environment or our foreign policy or whatever it may be. And they wanna know, will we square up with reality and find better ways to move forward? There are some who are afraid and scared that their lives as they have come to know their lives and this country, well, that they're undergoing fundamental change and they're very uncertain about the future and scared about it and confused about it often. Some of the folks we talk to actually hold all of these views simultaneously or some portion of them simultaneously as you might, as I do personally. But here's the thing, most of the people we talked with most of the people by far the vast, vast majority of the people, no matter what their lived experiences are, believe we can do better as a country. They believe that we can live up better to our ideals, not that we should be idealistic, we need to face reality is what they're saying, but that there are ideals in this country, some of which we have not lived up to yet, but that this country has always sought to get closer to them, to be a more perfect union and no matter where I talk to folks, no matter whether it was rural Kansas or a Native American reservation in New Mexico or a big city of New Orleans or Houston, no matter where I talk to folks, they all believe that we need to keep striving to move closer to America's ideals and to becoming a more perfect union. Does the president Acknowledge that we have these different lived experiences about being an American today? And does he call us forward to search, to yearn for, to discover, to reclaim, or just claim maybe just for the first time moving forward? Not what our differences are, but what we do hold in common and how we can build on that so that we can productively deal with our real differences. Does the president do that? Does he step forward and actually do that or simply put forward a version of his America, which will leave out so many people in our country? It seems to me that the time has come for us to co-create our future together, to articulate not simply what we are against, but more importantly, what we are for and what we're trying to build together, that word build again, 
It's part of our country's DNA. It's part of who we are. It's part of what I believe does make our country special and important and vital and vibrant. We need to get back to it. Instead of dividing ourselves, instead of polarizing ourselves, instead of demonizing each other, instead of pushing each other into corners, instead of questioning our motivations and intentions, how about if we spend a little time figuring out what we're for? What piece of America can we be for? And how do we build on that together so that actually we can work through the real differences that we do face? And let me be clear about this. This is not a call for empty patriotism. This is not a call for empty patriotism. The tensions that we are experiencing today, well, they're the seedbed for creating something anew, to beginning again, to moving forward. It is, you know, patriotism is at its heart if you look it up and study it, which I've had the luxury of doing and the benefit of doing and the joy of doing. Patriotism is defined as love of country. Patriotism is defined as devotion to country, not simply when we like everything, but to fight for the heart and soul of our country when we believe things have gone awry, when they've gone off track, when we're not living up to our ideals, when we're not moving more and more to becoming a more perfect union. That's the definition of patriotism. And that's the deep patriotism that I believe the president and the governor of Iowa need to call each and all of us back to on Tuesday in the State of the Union message and in the response to the State of the Union. So let me just conclude with a couple of quick thoughts. This tool, the State of the Union scorecard, I want you to use it. I hope you'll use it. I think it'll be fun to use. I think it'll help us, each of us, figure out what the heck's going on and whether or not what the president and the governor of Iowa are saying make any sense. Whether or not we can follow along, whether or not we really believe they're speaking to us, whether or not they're meeting us where we are, whether or not we feel seen and heard, the old country song, the refrain of which is, I can't see me in your eyes. Do you feel the president and the Republican governor sees you in his eyes and her eyes? Use the scorecard, write back to me at rich at the harwoodinstitute.org and let me know how you scored the speeches and as importantly, if not more importantly, what they said to you, how you felt about them, how you feel as you listen to them. Now, in the coming weeks, I'm gonna come back for another Harwood half hour and spend more time talking about our new report, Civic Virus, Why Polarization is a Misdiagnosis what we can do, what it says to us, what the implications may be for us, how we combat this fight or flight instinctive response that so many of us are in today. Let me just say for now that I believe that there's a fundamental choice that each of us face, that our country faces. And the choice is this, are we, are you, going to surrender to false notions of polarization and give up? Are you and are we going to surrender to false notions of polarization and give up? Or are we, will you, commit ourselves to rebuilding this country and finding ways to create a new path forward? A fairer path, a more equitable path, a more inclusive path, a more hopeful path forward. I hope you'll join with me in creating this path. So as always, thanks for joining me for another episode of Harwood Half Hour. Go to our website to download a copy of the Civic Virus Report. You can find it there. You'll find other tools that you can use. You'll find the scorecard in our feature section on our homepage, download it and use it. And in the meantime, my hope for you is that you and your loved ones stay healthy and in good spirits and be well. Thanks for joining me.